Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to uh, the spring series of OBSSR's lecture series. My name is Mike Spittle and I'm, I work in the office. Um, it is really my pleasure to bring to you today Dr. Carl Leshway. Dr. Carl Leshway is a professor in clinical psychology at the University of Maryland where he is the founding director of the Center for Addictions, Personality and Emotion Research or CAPER. His research is translational in nature, applying basic psychopathology findings from laboratory settings to the development of novel assessment and treatment strategies in clinical settings. His research spans the clinical domains of addictions, personality pathology, and mood disorders, and he's most interested in the common processes across these conditions. His research has been funded continuously by NIH since 2003, primarily by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. In any event, with that as introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Carl Leshway. Well, thank you very much for having me here, and, and I'm especially appreciative because just about everything we're able to do in our lab is funded by NIDA and NIAAA. And so thanks. I can bend down a little also if need be. And so it's, uh, in addition to this being an honor to be here, I also just appreciate very much the opportunities that NIH has, has given us. So um, what I'll present today is, is a lot of the product of that. And, and I will say just up front, uh, you know, I will be talking about adolescent risk taking, but I think this presentation is going to be as much about the distance between what we want things to be and and maybe what things are in science. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the initial ideas that we had in our lab and some of the kind of optimism we had and, and ways in which that hasn't necessarily worked out exactly like we thought it would and, and kind of what that struggle is of kind of realizing what maybe you thought was the case may not be, but then seeing what the kind of right or other directions are. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, can you hear me better now? Okay, good. I've never actually not been heard before, so this is uh, a nice change. Okay, so, so that'll be kind of the, the kind of backdrop of, of what I'll be talking about today. So in terms of thinking about risk-taking behavior, and specifically adolescent risk-taking behavior, I, there's nothing I'm going to say here that isn't very familiar to everyone in terms of identifying this as a clinically relevant problem. In terms of thinking about how do we ultimately intervene with adolescents and to either prevent or slow down risk-taking behavior, one, sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm being interrogated. I, <laughs> it wasn't me, I swear. Uh, well, I'll just keep going in the meantime. I still have these two lights. <laughs> so in terms of thinking about what are the most reasonable to kind of predict or, or, or really give us a sense of what do, where do we want to be intervening, one potential area is in personality. And there's been a variety of ways that we've studied personality, let's say covariates of risk-taking behavior. And, and two of the most common have been sensation-seeking and impulsivity. Uh, Sensation-seeking certainly is an incredibly um, well-studied and strong predictor of risk-taking behavior. Impulsivity also, I mean, it's a little complicated by the fact that there's so many different dimensions and ways that people study it. But I think largely there's, there's reasonable agreement that these are personality factors. Um, but one of the things that, uh, you know, s people have been interested in is, is moving beyond largely self-report measures. And one possibility, at least as we started, was thinking about how do we take these constructs, at least say of sensation seeking, and make it into a behavioral measure. And it's actually really quite hard. If you look in the literature, it's hard to imagine a, a variable that's so powerful that there hasn't been really any kind of behavioral measure of it. And, and we have a few failed grant applications and failed ideas about how to try to do that. And, and I think in thinking about 
you know, other directions, we became really interested in the idea of risk taking more globally and, and a propensity to take risks. And this is actually a, an incredibly hard variable to study with self-report because you really find that you're either asking about impulsive choice or you're asking about sensation seeking or you're simply asking about behavior. And if you're thinking about trying to understand the processes underlying risk taking, you don't want to just ask about the behavior itself. I mean, there's clearly some logical issues with that. So that, that moved us into the idea of trying to develop behavioral tasks of a kind of a propensity to take risks. And there are many um, very good risk taking measures. There's people in the audience who have very um, well known and, and well utilized behavioral measures. But one that kind of stands out as, as kind of being a gold standard is the Iowa gambling task. And uh, just to basically, I'm, people are probably familiar with it, but just to kind of run through an example. Uh, you're shown this set of cards, and, and for the sake of presentation, let's say that decks A and B are largely the same, and decks C and D are largely the same, and you, as you pick, uh, there's some kind of a consequence that happens. So in this case, picking decks A and B result in this large win, in this case, $100. Um, for decks C and D, it results in a smaller win. So not surprisingly, most people continue to go to decks A and B because you're earning more money than C and D. Um, over time, there's a loss contingency that's added on top so that now, uh, more times than not, decks A and B in the end are actually a losing proposition. So even though you're getting a large win, you're getting an even larger loss. In contrast, although they're boring, decks C and D have a much smaller loss. So in the end, you have an overall gain. And so what the task essentially does is treats risk taking essentially as a decision. And it's, are you going to make, in this case, what's considered the right decision, and that would be the less risky alternative. So in this case, decks C and D are considered the advantageous choice, where decks A and B, the risky ones, are considered the disadvantageous choice. There's a, a lot of literature showing that uh, this task is very related to a variety of addictive behaviors and other risk taking. But in terms of thinking about what exactly are we trying to measure in terms of risk taking, we became interested in kind of an alternative perspective, uh, maybe a complementary perspective is probably the best way to say it, and that's thinking of risk taking on a continuum. And so it's not just identifying what the risky or disadvantageous choice is, but actually thinking about that kind of line between, do I push it a little bit more? There's definitely some advantages of taking risks that aren't necessarily captured in tasks like this. And at some point, everyone has kind of a risk tolerance where the benefits of being risky start to wane and the negatives start to take hold. And where different people make choices is in terms of saying, this is enough risk for me is where we were interested in. And so this led to uh, the balloon analog risk task, just to give you a, a little diagram of that. So the participant is shown this computer generated balloon and they're given the option to press the, okay, there we go, press the pump here and each time that they do that, the balloon inflates a little bit. They earn some money. I, I, I'm not gonna talk about the importance of whether you should use real rewards or not, partially because we haven't done any parametric studies of this, but personally I think theoretically it's a little hard to feel like you're studying risk taking if you're just doing it hypothetically. So we've always used real reinforcers and in fact in our earliest studies uh, we had used reasonably high ones um, such as five cents per pump. So there's a, you know, as these kind of add up there's a, a pretty meaningful uh, benefit of being risky and, and potential loss of, of those consequences. So what would happen here is that you uh, press the pump and it gets larger and larger. You start accumulating money in this temporary bank and at some point the balloon can explode. Hopefully not that loudly because then we're studying probably something else. But So the balloon pops here and then in another case you stop and press the left. I have to admit, it's not much cooler, but it's slightly cooler when we do it in, in the lab. I'm, I'm kind of a basic programmer, so if you're a good programmer, you might. I can usually be out-programmed by a 10-year-old, but, but at least I can program. So uh, in this case, we 
uh, you press collect and now you earn that money and you don't lose it. So when you think about what's happening, each additional pump in the beginning is giving you lots of money. Let's say the five cent example. Each, by the second pump, you're doubling your potential gain. And it's going up five cents each time. Now at a certain point, let's say after you've made 20 pumps, you have a dollar on the line. Making another pump is only worth five cents more, but you're putting that dollar on the line. And depending on where someone's risk tolerance is, that's going to, you know, hypothetically, that's going to have a big impact as to where they decide to stop. And so, uh, as I said before, the, you can use any, in this case, in the first studies, we used a nickel, but you can use anywhere. We've used um, as little as one cent, uh, as much as 25 cents. And in the version that we use most frequently, the balloon ranges from one pump to 128 pumps. And the average uh, break point is usually around 64. And uh, I can talk a little bit about the implications of that. Most people are risk averse on the task. And you don't necessarily see a distribution around 64. You usually see it around 35 to 40. And as much as we're in the business of talking about the dangers of risk taking, we know most people are risk averse. So this isn't surprising that, that people are kind of modeling that on the task. And so this is kind of the idea of the distribution. Um, as you see, making few pumps is not going to earn you much. Making more and more is giving you correspondingly more. And then at some point, now you've gone too far, and now additional pumps, you're going to make more on balloons where you collect, but you're going to pop more also. And so because of that, you don't earn anything on that. So it's, you have that distribution. Um, how do people learn when they're at risk? When it's likely to pop? There are multiple trials? Yeah, sorry. There's, um, we've used about 30 trials. We find that uh, you get the best data at around 20. That gives people enough of a, an option. We, we, yeah, we make sure that the um, average breakpoint is always consistent within every, say, block of 10 trials so that, that there's a chance to learn. Um, you know, I think probably because of my, my background doing animal studies, we gave people as little instruction as possible. There's certainly other perspectives telling them uh, you know, where the balloon would have popped the last time or what the actual structure is. I still think, you know, unfortunately, those parametric studies, as I said before about the money, are, they're important studies, but they're just less likely to be conducted. And I think at this point, it probably would be useful to, to do a very clear parametric study to understand how we can move risk taking around with information or with kind of knowledge about what the consequences are. So it's, it's an important question. So these are from our earliest studies. And this is just to give you an example. This is 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, the study was conducted while I was at Brown. As we all know, uh, there's no one weirder than a Brown undergraduate. So we didn't want to get everyone from Brown. So we made sure that no more than, say, 10% of any particular participant couldn't come from any college in the area and that at least 20% had to have not gone to college. So we had a pretty broad distribution and we used five cents per pump. And this, is, uh, th this isn't the way we, we did the analyses continuously, but just to give you a, a sense visually here, if you're to look at number of risk behaviors they engaged in in their actual life, this is across substance use, across delinquency behaviors, across health and safety behaviors. Uh, you know, as we know, there's definitely important differences across risk behaviors, but there is often a reasonable coherence um, within them as well. And so when we're able, we try to think about it more as, well, let's say it differently. We think of it less as this is a task of any particular risk behavior and more as a kind of general propensity to take risks. And so that's why we often combine these. And so just so you can see the, this is, an this is from the 70s, this is enormous. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a um, number of risk behaviors here. We have zero to one, and then all the way over here we have six or more in their real life. And so here we have average number of pumps. As you can see, there's kind of a, a stepwise increase. Uh, we have modest correlations between self-reported impulsivity and sensation seeking. And to be quite honest, those are the best correlations with impulsivity we've ever seen. I think this raises some questions about is this the best task of risk taking? May there be a better one that gets at this? Are there 
some other things going on. Or maybe these constructs, uh, by the time you have behavioral versus self-report and just the differences in the constructs, maybe they're not as related as we'd like to think. I think that question's still up in the air. But what this does raise is the idea that the BART is not necessarily sharing a lot of variance with these measures. And so it has the potential to add something incrementally above and beyond them as we're interested in relating it to the real world risk behaviors. And so in this case, what's interesting is the, the BART wasn't just related to the real world risk behaviors, but actually did so in an incremental way above and beyond what you get with the self-report measures. So we have a <clears throat> similar effect with our youth studies, and this is basically the same design, 13 to 17 year olds. Um, the task is largely the same, except now instead of money, we actually have a prize meter where you know we have a room where the kids go in and we have all different kinds of prizes, and then we kind of take them out. And then uh, based on the number of points they get, they get to pick from the, the prize closet. And so it's the same basic idea, but it tries not to get so caught up into the, into the financial part. And you get the same general relationship. Um, everything's a little more modest, but um, you still get a significant incremental bump on top of sensation seeking and impulsivity. And again, you get that same general structure. I will say that by no means do all studies that have used the task found the same cross-sectional relationships. Generally, what you see when larger sums of money are used, you tend to see that the relationships are stronger. Again, we have not done any parametric studies, so I don't want to take too much responsibility for saying that. But I will say that um, typically, my sense is from the literature, we get stronger effects when you have more on the line. And so this leads us to the question of, can we use this kind of a task to predict prospectively risk-taking behavior? And as I started to allude to in the beginning, this idea of the way you want things to be, and I, you know, I th really had this vision that we could, at a very young age, have kids complete the BARD and that we'd be able to identify who was risk prone. And I mean, in my worst moments, I had this like vision of like in utero BART and we'd know right away who was going to be risky. And as soon as they come out, we'd start, you know, prepping them. And, and so obviously that's foolish. And unfortunately for me, I think the data has forced me to come to terms with some of that foolishness. And I think it's a, an important lesson for people doing work with behavioral tests that you we have to really think about what it is that we're trying to accomplish with them and really be honest about what the strengths and weaknesses of the data are. Because in, in my experience, what happens is we often think a task is going to be great and then everyone hates it. And I don't think that that's necessarily the right answer. I think the right answer is thinking about where its strengths are and what it can do. And I think what I'm going to show you now is a good example of that. So this is our longitudinal study. I'm going to present data from our first three waves of data, and uh, I'll say, you know, through the fourth wave, which is happening now, we have 84% um, follow-up, so a reasonable um, selection of the participants that started the study. So what we have here is across three waves of data, and these are BART scores at wave one, wave two, and wave three. So essentially, um, they're 10 to 12 here, they're 11 to 13 here, and then they're 12 to 14 here. And what we see is a pretty reasonable year-to-year -year correlation of 0.5 from here to here and then 0.67 from here to here. In terms of reliability on a behavioral task, that's, that's pretty strong. So we're getting a, a reasonable sense that we have some reliability in our measurement. Now, of course, you can see that they've gone up each year. So by reliability, I don't mean that the scores stay stable, but in terms of their rank order, that stays reasonably consistent as you see a general increase across individuals. Now, when we um, come next, one question we have here is, is this a practice effect? You know, are they getting more risky because if you were to do the task three times, you would just naturally get it? Or is there something developmentally as we think about as you 
go into middle adolescence, you should be getting riskier. So at least at a developmental level, this is kind of what you'd expect. You know, about a, it's about a five pump increase each year. So one of the nice things about a behavioral task that you don't necessarily get to do with a self-report, and by no means, I actually love self-report measures. I think they, they get more critique than they should. So I don't mean to, to disparage them, but there are definitely some things you can and can't do with self-report measures. And one example, would be now if you were to break the task down into the first 10 balloons, the second 10 balloons, and the third 10 balloons. And these are all set up so that the structure of where the break points are in those first, middle, and last 10 are exactly the same. So hypothetically, you should see if there's kind of no effect of what's happening, you should see a flat line. And what you see is this kind of interesting pattern all three years. And that's, they start off a little risky, they come down, and then they kind of level off. Same kind of thing all three years. So if this was truly just a practice effect from year to year to year, then we wouldn't see this drop here. If it was purely a practice effect, then we'd probably see something like this, and like this, and like that. If we were to see that, then we really couldn't have any confidence that this was a developmental shift and not just repeated measures of the task. So this is a, a nice feature of using something like this. Now the next piece is how does it relate to a particular risk behavior? Now at this age, uh, you know, fortunately, they're not engaging in a lot of the kind of more serious, um, what we're interested in in this study is HIV risk behavior. So there's not a, enough data. So we really wanted to focus on what was the most common risk behavior at this point, which was alcohol use. And so what you see in this case, at least in terms of the patterns, you're seeing an increase in alcohol use. This is percent who had tried alcohol at all. And you're seeing, again, that same kind of increase with the BART. Now, what's interesting here is that if the BART was predicting risk behavior as we had hoped, then BART score here should predict alcohol use here. And that does not happen. Instead, what happens is the change in alcohol from year to year is correlated, even above and beyond sensation seeking and impulsivity, with the change in BART score. So it's this type of kind of um, time lag covariate analysis. And what this is telling us is that it isn't necessarily that BART is this ingrained personality factor, but more it may be a good analog of actual risk behavior. So instead of it necessarily being used as a predictor, now I don't, we still have lots of waves of data, so I don't want to say this ultimately may not bear out as a predictor, but at least at this point, where we're seeing that maybe it's most useful is what, you know, in terms of what's happening to the youth, despite all the differences that each youth experiences in their environment and um, their experiences, that the changes that is happening in the real world are also being reflected in the changes that are happening on the task in the laboratory. And this tells us that maybe this task can be used effectively more so as an analog of risk behavior because it's really hard to study risk processes in the real world and especially based on real world risk behaviors. And if we can study this here, this gives us opportunities to look at neural behavioral correlates. It gives us opportunities to look at how if we introduce some type of a stressor or other kind of environmental factor, how does that move risk behavior around? It gives us a lot of opportunities that we don't have when we're focused merely on thinking about a, a linear prediction. And this is very new data, and so I don't want to make too much of this, but it actually seems, looking in, into the fourth year data, that instead of BART score at year one predicting risk behavior at year four, we're actually getting the opposite. And so it's risk behavior at year one is pretty strongly predicting BART behavior at year four. Now again, this is, we're just getting the data in and you know, I don't want to make too much of something that might just end up being one blip in terms of the data, but it does suggest that the experiences that you're having as a youth in those early years in terms of the things that happen and who your friends are and the risks you're taking and the things that you're doing 
may have an impact that shows up on you know, the sensitive risk behavior measure in the laboratory. And so again, I don't want to make too much of that, but to say that really this gives us some sense that we might be able to use this to understand risk behavior in a different way than we had originally thought about it. And if there are questions or anyone wants to raise anything, we can do it at the end, but if you have them now, feel free to, to ask. So in terms of kind of interim where we are, um, I mean, I've kind of actually said it seven times, so I won't repeat it an eighth time, but um, what this, where this does lead us is to think about how can we use it in, in the lab as a, a way to understand process. And so the first study uh, that we did was actually conducted by uh, one of our graduate students who is now taking a faculty position at Johns Hopkins, Liz Reynolds. And she was really interested in the way that peers impact risk-taking behavior. And Larry Steinberg and others have done some really interesting work looking at peer effects. But what she was really interested in is teasing apart to what extent peers have an impact simply because they're there versus peers have an impact in terms of what they're actually doing to try to encourage risk behavior. And so in terms of her study, um, and as dissertations go, just as a completely separate point, although she's not here to hear this, uh, this was a really hard dissertation. She brought in 180 uh, college students, and they all had to bring in two friends, and they had to come in twice. So this was, I mean, she re really wanted to make sure that um, we had enough power to not just look at the effect of peers generally, but then that specific peer effect of kind of a more active versus a passive role. And so in terms of the study, there were three conditions. The first condition was an alone condition where uh, the individual just played the bark by themselves. So now everyone completed an alone, and then they came back again, and they either did alone again, and that was one group, 60 individuals. Then there was peer present. And so in this case, this was another 60, they did alone first, and now they came in with two of their friends. And the friends could watch what they're doing on a second screen in the room, but they weren't allowed to say anything or have any active impact. And then the third group was the encouraging group. And in this case, the two friends, without the participant knowing, were told that, well, they were, weren't just told they were, they were paid based on how many balloons the friend popped. So they were actually, in, they were paid to not only just encourage, but to encourage reckless and risky behavior. So these are our three conditions. And let's put a picture of her because I, um, she's not here to see this. So this is our three conditions. We have, um, this is the alone condition, and then basically no change when they come back in again alone. Um, the peer present condition, this is um, marginally different than alone. And then we have a nice bump here for encourage. And so what this suggests is that it isn't just the peer being there, but it's specifically what the peer is doing. Now this has a big impact for a lot of research where we just show someone a picture of their peers and say, you know, think about them being here, or, it had, or a lot in terms of when we try to do this work in the scanner where we don't usually bring the friends into the scanner. I think that kind of ruins, I'm no neuroscientist, but I think that ruins everything. And so that raises some questions about being sure that when we're studying a peer effect that they're real, we're really being careful about what it is we're trying to study and how we're doing it. Uh, what she's actually doing now because of the, the size of the groups is to try to see now within this group, there are some people that go up a lot and others that don't move that much. And so we're interested in what are particular moderators for whom even though their peers are having this kind of, uh, or, or engaging in this behavior, that they're kind of impervious to it, whereas for others that are really sensitive to it. And so what this suggests is that it may not necessarily be anything about where they start off in terms of their riskiness, but how much their riskiness moves in response to the peers. And I'll tell you, we just finished a study uh, with uh, Suchitra Christian Saran at Yale, where it's a much more simple design. It's actually on the computer. You have a picture of an adolescent who's matched by gender and ethnicity. 
and you think that they're, you know, we do all the elaborate stuff. You pretend you're on Google and you, you make them think that this adolescent is in the other room. And all that happens is every time you pump under the average number of pumps and it doesn't pop, so that, that would be a time to be more risky, the peer just says, pump more. I mean, it's not, we, don't, we didn't want to get into thinking about what peers say. I mean, I'm, I've clearly accepted I'm, I'm too old to understand that at this point. So which is very simple, pump more, and when they pump a higher amount and it doesn't pop, it says just right. But every other condition, if they pop it, whatever happens, then, then the peer has nothing to say. And even that has a significant impact in risk taking. And in fact, kids who were smokers were riskier than kids who weren't in response to the peer effect. And the most interesting thing is that, remember I said before, there's not a good correlation between the task and self-reported impulsivity. If you were to look without the peer version in this study, you get no relationship between impulsivity and the BART. But if you look in response to the peers, then the correlation is in the point fours. And so what this suggests is that when someone's filling out an impulsivity measure, they're thinking not just about who they are in this kind of antiseptic environment and filling this out alone, they're thinking about who they are generally, which often includes their peers and other kind of in environmental influences. And so when we create something that's more similar to a situation in which they would be impulsive, we actually start to see a bit more coherence among these measures. This is a smaller study. There's only about 40 participants. So I think we, we need to have more data and replicate to really say that strongly. But it was interesting to not see it in one case and then to see it in the other. Um, then another thing is that you can study motivational mechanisms. And this starts getting into, um, even though we may not necessarily be able to think about HIV risk in terms of BART predicting, we can think about HIV, HIV risk or other uh, vulnerability to risk taking in terms of what motivates an adolescent to be risky or not risky. And this is a study. Uh, done by a social psychologist in our lab, Catalina Kopetz, and she was very interested in very modest framing effects and the way that they can impact what happens on the task. And so her two questions, study one was, what if we could um, either enhance or detract the salience of the gain or the loss in terms of what happens on the task? And then the second one was, um, once you have kind of low risk, what are the factors that can keep someone from becoming more risky? And I'll explain, that was a little confusing. I'll explain that more clearly when we get to study two. So in the first study, I have 65 college students. Uh, again, the, the issue of focusing on minimizing losses or maximizing gains. All we did on the task, remember what the task looked like before, we just merely put a plus sign or a minus sign next to the money that's accumulating on that balloon. Now, in some versions, we don't show the accumulation at all. But in this case, every pump you make, 5 cents, 10 cents, 15 cents, 20 cents. And now all it says is, in the um, focus on gains, it says this is how much you can make if you press collect. Uh, and then the other one has the negative sign, and it says this is how much you can lose if the balloon pops. So there's absolutely no change in the task just merely whether we're trying to focus the participants on the gain or the loss. And what happens is, and I just want to explain this slowly so it's clear, uh, we did this within subjects. So you had the first BART, regardless of which condition you got, and then the second BART. And then here you have maximizing gains, and here you have minimizing losses. So the first important thing is that when you get maximizing gains first. So for those participants, they're at around 41 pumps. For those that get the minus sign first, they're at about 35 pumps. So we're talking about a six or so pump difference just in terms of whether you have a plus or a minus sign there. Now, the group that we're really interested in is the group that has um, the minimizing loss because what happens now when we flip them over to the other do they preserve that low level of risk taking? Or now when they get the plus sign, do they just end up largely looking like the group that got the plus sign first? 
And what you see here is that, you know, not completely, but they basically go back up to the same level. So whatever impact the minus sign had initially, by the time they get the plus sign again, it's kind of gone. Now this is a little bit of a leap, but if you think about prevention programming, we think about at a young age, we try to get kids and tell them drugs are bad and don't do this and don't do that, and, and these are all the things that you shouldn't do, and that has an impact. But that impact, once they start getting other messages from their peers and other people, that impact can be pretty dramatically minimized. And so what she was interested in is how can we preserve this lower level of risk taking once we take the negative sign away? And so this is in the second study and she used a subliminal priming paradigm where essentially what happens is um, before each trial they got a, a word that was either that risk is bad or being cautious is good. And so the point here is moving away from necessarily what you shouldn't do and more towards what you should be focused on. They're both anti-risk messages, but one does it through trying to place the spotlight on the benefits of being cautious, where the other puts it on the reasons why you shouldn't be risky. So it's a, a very subtle manipulation. And what you see is that in this study, we're actually preparing this for publication now, um, sorry, so that you start with the minimizing losses and everyone's, uh, you know, fairly low. The group that gets risk taking is bad in their subliminal message essentially looks, you know, just before like when we put the plus sign. So now they get the plus sign and essentially the message had no impact because this is exactly what it looked like when we had negative to plus before without the subliminal message. Now it essentially doesn't move and it's flat when we have the cautious is good. So this is in terms of thinking about ways that we can connect to motivation. You can use a task like this to see these kind of in the moment changes. Now we don't know if these changes would persist beyond the, the context of the subliminal message. Those would be the additional studies that we'll do next. But at least it suggests that we can show these momentary changes with the task. And the one other thing I, I wanted to mention real quick, um, we've also been looking at uh, different psychopathologies and the way in which certain individuals become more risky when they uh, are kind of emotionally evoked. And two good examples of that, one is borderline personality disorder and the other would be social phobia. And in both cases, when we think about, if we really think about the theory of both of these disorders, we don't really expect risk taking or other kind of problem behaviors when there's no emotional evocation. Unfortunately, a lot of the behavioral studies that we do when we want to look at, say, how individuals with borderline differ from those without or social phobia from those without, we often test them in kind of very stable conditions and, and we're kind of surprised when we don't see a difference. And we have several studies in our lab where we didn't find any differences between these groups with the task and we thought, well, maybe, maybe the task isn't picking up on the difference. And so um, Alexis uh, Matasiewicz, who's actually here, who's in our, our lab, did her thesis looking at borderline and, and using an emotional script and found that the borderline participants got significantly riskier after the script and the controls actually got less risky. And we found the exact same thing in a study with uh, Monique Ernst and Danny Pine with social phobia where we used a kind of a modified Trier task to produce social anxiety that the socially phobic kids looked less risky at baseline but then looked more risky after the social phobia induction or the, the, the social fear induction whereas the controls went in the opposite direction. So it's just another example of ways where if we think about what we're trying to accomplish instead of just thinking, oh, we have this cool task, let's use it, you can actually find things in places where you weren't finding them before. But this still leaves another kind of limitation in our thinking, and that's been, we've only really thought about risk taking in terms of positive reinforcement. And, you know, especially maybe when you think about adolescence, that might be common, you know, kids 
Um, very few, uh, you know, we think about negative reinforcement and say something like heroin withdrawal. We think about adults. We think about people who've been using drugs for a really long time. We've been thinking about the drug provides a negative reinforcer to help them kind of get over the emotional state. When you think about kids, you don't, you don't really think about that as much. Um, however, if you think about the types of experiences that lead kids to use substances and take other risks, you can often see that there is a fair amount of aversive stimulation that kind of pushes them in that direction. And being risky actually ameliorates that, not in a physiological way, as you might see with a drug like heroin. But think about, you know, you're an awkward 12-year-old, and you're at a party, and other kids are drinking, and you know, you're like a good kid, and you're in your head thinking, I'm not supposed to do this, and I promised my mom I wouldn't, and all the other kids are drinking, and they're making fun of you, and all the pressure is on you. And the only thing that's going to make that go away is to drink in that case. And so you can think of substance use in that case not as positive reinforcement, but actually as negative reinforcement. But there are no, there really aren't even self-report measures of this, but there's very, I mean, as far as I'm, con as I'm aware, there's no behavioral measures that get at negative reinforcement as a process. And so what we did was um, going along the Simpsons line, this is the Maryland resource for the behavioral understanding of reinforcement from negative stimuli, which of course we had first and then we did the acronym, um, which is not true. And so we used the same structure. But now, instead of pumping up the balloon for money, positive reinforcement, of course, no one talks about it. No one says, you know, these risk-taking tests are positive reinforcement. If you think about the reinforcer, that's what it is. However, now we have um, the participant wear headphones, and there's this very aversive noise in it. We've also thought about using emotional scripts there, too. But for right now, it's just kind of a white noise with this honking sound every now and then at an unpredictable um, interval. So you're listening to this, and now you pump up the balloon to actually make the noise go away. And so whereas before you're taking risks to obtain money, now you're taking risks to make a negative stimulus um, subside in one way or another. And I will say it's a little complicated, so I'll go through it slowly, maybe twice. Um, this is one of the other problems with negative reinforcement. It's just not as simple. The tests aren't as intuitive, um, but hopefully we got close. So just to give you an idea, so you have this kind of uh, uninflated balloon, and you have um, this little dial here, and you can click in the number of pumps. Um, there's a lot of controversy about whether on the task you should have people make the pumps individually or actually type the number in and have the balloon inflate by itself. That's a whole nother presentation for another day. But just to say, you know, we've done it in both ways. Um, it's just easier to show here in terms of the, the dial. So basically, you make a certain number of pumps. So in this case, 48. And now what happens is you have a duration that you have to listen to the noise for. Now, there are lots of decisions we had to make. Did you want the noise going on the whole time that they're deciding, but we didn't want people to rush their decision. So, and we also, in thinking about using this ultimately to study um, uh, neural processes, we also wanted to have very clear parts of the task so that you could look and see what was happening at those different parts. So you have this kind of decision period. You decide how many pumps you want to make, and then the duration of the noise lasts for the number of pumps. So in this case, it's a little bit more than half. And if you were to make more pumps, then the duration, the green would only say go up to here. If you were to make fewer pumps, the green might go up to there. So you have a very clear immediate consequence of how much risk you're willing to take. The more risk you're willing to take, the less noise you get. Now, we also tried having it titrate the volume. But that didn't work. I mean, volume is so, I mean, first off, we can't, we have to use a safe level. And volume is, is not linear. And so as soon as it starts to come down a little, it's completely ineffective. So we had to use the maximum volume and titrate the amount of time. So you make your number of pumps. You have your consequence. Then you find out whether the balloon popped or not. 
Now, this is a case where the decision you make methodologically has to be driven by what you're trying to study in the real world. My first impulse was, if they pop the balloon, crank the noise back up, because that seems reasonable. But if you're an adolescent and you're deciding to drink in that case, the negative thing, you know, so basically you drink to make the peer pressure go away. If something bad happens to you, it's not, I get so much peer pressure. That would be akin to pumping the noise back up. What the consequence is, is it's a loss of an opportunity in the future. I get a DUI and so now I can't go to college. Or um, I get in trouble with my parents so I don't get to go out. Or, or I ruin my future. Um, in this case then, what we have to do, and this is where it gets a little tricky, we can't just pump the noise back up because that would be the wrong consequence. We have to take away an opportunity in the future. And it has to be probabilistic. So now, already, this is so much more complicated than the BART, than the original one. And so what we do in this case is there's a lottery. Uh, there's a wheel at the end of every five trials. And every balloon you pop, you lose your lottery ticket. So if you're safe, you'll keep all your lottery tickets. If you're risky, you're not going to experience much noise, but you're not going to keep all your lottery tickets. And we have different lotteries. We have a parametric study. We have a dollar, three dollars, nine dollars. Turns out we put all that effort in. It really doesn't matter. We do know that the bigger the lottery, the fewer pumps they make. That's hardly rocket science. But in terms of any of the other relationships, it really didn't matter. And so in this case, it pops. So now the red would be a balloon that you popped. And these three greens were balloons you didn't. You have your lottery, and then you either win or you lose. And so that's basically the task. And what we care about is the number of pumps you make to make the negative stimulus go away. So anyone have questions about that? OK. Hopefully it's because it was clear and not because it feels awkward to ask. So this is our summary. The pumps reduce aversive noise. Pumping too much can result in a later loss or an opportunity cost. The noise is not affected by the balloon popping, and it's separated in time. Each group um, has a different value in terms of here's the, the lottery scale. You see um, 3, 9, 1, 3, 1, 9. These are all the different um, the lottery groups. And the outcome measure is the number of pumps. So what, uh, this was a NIAAA-funded study with 163 college freshmen, no hearing impairments. Otherwise, we kind of just took whoever came as long as they had had some experience using alcohol. And so 95.7% uh, you know, had ever drank. Um, so what I'm going to show you, although it's fairly comparable, I'm going to show you among the, ev the regular drinkers. So the first thing is, the first time we've used the task, so is it reliable? If you were to do a split half, now you can see, um, so here you have the mean pumps on the first half of the game, and then on the second half of the game, and you have a nice little line here, so the correlation is actually 0.9. So pretty reliable in terms of what they do in the beginning and what they do at the end. Again, similar to the other game, they start to feel a little more um, I don't know if comfortable with the noise or more aware of wanting the money because they actually make less pumps as a group over time. But again, the kind of rank ordering doesn't change. So we have nice reliability on the task. Um, in terms of uh, the results, and this is um, in, I think, I don't know if it's come out yet, but the, the paper will be in ACER. And so whereas we don't really get correlations with self-report measures um, with the regular bar as much more with actual behavior. We got pretty good correlations in terms of constructs that should matter here. So we have a relationship with trade anxiety, depressive symptoms, and then uh, the difficulties in emotion regulation scale. So we get people who were making more pumps, people who said, forget the money, I'm going to do whatever I have to to make this noise go away, were the same ones who were scoring higher in emotion regulation problems, depressive symptoms, and trade anxiety. Um, what's also interest, interesting is it was related to specifically disengagement coping. 
And so that, that's also something in, in effect that you would expect to find. But what was really interesting was that um, it was correlated with self-reported problems. So the more that you took the negative reinforcement response, the more problems you reported. It wasn't related to frequency of drinking, but actual problems associated with drinking. This is still a, you know, a pretty modest correlation, but what was especially interesting, less about the magnitude of the correlations and more about the specificity, was if we looked at drinking motives and you were to think about kind of the four most common motives, if you have um, coping and conformity, and then you have socialization and enhancement, the bottom two are really about positive reinforcement. The top two are really about negative reinforcement. So interestingly, the more that you say your motives to drink are about wanting to cope and to conform, the more that you were pumping the balloon up to avoid the noise. And these are, these are you know, pretty reasonable correlations. However, the extent to which you reported uh, motives based on socialization and enhancement was not significantly related. And so that's, you know, again, thinking about the importance of these tasks, Specificity is really important and, and really being able to know what we can measure and what we can't measure. And so, uh, you know, this is a, just a first study. We've now collected a second year with the same students and so we'll be following that up. And so in general, um, you know, kind of thinking about what we have here, uh, you know, we're still optimistic that these type of behavioral measurements can be a useful tool for understanding how and why adolescents are risky and to be able to study particular processes that we think are important. I think the book is still out a little bit on whether we can ultimately use it to predict behavior, but I think in, in the short term, really focusing on where its strengths are um, would be really important. And I did just want to um, just take two or three minutes, I know we're getting close to the end, but to just talk a little bit about a clinical extension. And this is uh, based on something called behavioral activation. The idea of thinking, focusing on positive reinforcement and specifically the impact of aversive stimuli in terms of negative reinforcement um, leads to, uh, in terms of our lab, thinking about what might be potential intervention targets. And so we've kind of taken behavioral activation, which was actually a treatment used for depression based on learning theory. Now, even though it's very focused on depression, if you really look at what the early theorists said, they talked a lot about um, the impact of depression was because there was not a lot of immediate guaranteed reward for healthy behavior, and there was an overabundance of negative um, kind of impact for that healthy behavior, uh, or, or it wasn't paid attention to, or is actually punished. And then the alternative behaviors did have a lot of this kind of alternative unhealthy behavior. In this case, depressed behaviors did have a lot of immediate reward. And so the argument was that people continued to be depressed, at least at some level. I mean, obviously, this is not the only reason, but from the learning perspective, continue to be depressed at some level because the kind of unhealthy things they did got a little bit of attention and the healthy things they did either didn't or actually were punished. And so what this does is present a, a perspective in thinking about applying that to substance use and risk taking where we really want to focus on, and it's also in line with stuff like delayed discounting and intertemporal choice, really want to focus on getting a lot of positive reinforcement for healthy, appropriate behaviors to try to reduce risk-taking behaviors. And so it's based on three simple things. One is um, daily monitoring where you just basically lay out what you've been doing, get a good sense of what your pattern of behavior is, do it every single day to provide very immediate and guaranteed attention to these things. The second piece is kind of focusing on different life areas, but then specifically, what are values and activities within those life areas? So in this case, in the life area of relationships, a value might be to be a better son. Now values are fine, but they're still delayed. And so from that, we have daily activities 
of things that would then be connected to that value. So being a better son isn't just, yeah, I want to be a better son because who doesn't? It's telling my parents I love them every day, maybe even what time. Uh, make a special breakfast with mom on Saturday, be on time for school. Basically, very specific things that could now be rewarded and attended to on a daily basis to try to compete with what those alternatives might be. And then from that, you have essentially planning out your life. So um, here are the different things that I'm going to do. And in this case, at, at these specific times where I'm spending too much time in bed, I'm watching too much TV, now I'm going to plan to do a few key things that will be part of the bigger value, but much more about what happens in the moment. And in this case, then just holding yourself accountable. And this comes back to the idea of immediate and guaranteed. Did you do these things and what happened? I mean, I, I won't want to go into in too much detail, but this is the basic idea of the program. And we've used this now across several addictions. Uh, there's been three randomized control trials. One was in Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. The second was in JCCP. Um, the third one was in uh, Journal of Counseling Psychology. So in the first one, uh, we reduced treatment dropout actually at the Harbor Light Drug Treatment Center, if you're familiar with DC. Um, individuals who got this program just five times compared to um, individuals who got a supportive counseling to control for attention and contact time. Everyone else got the main treatment program. There was a 24% dropout, which is about what you'd expect in the control group, and only a 4% dropout in the in this group, which again was only five sessions. In the community smokers, we had a significant reduction in relapse. And then in the last one, in the problem drinking, we actually did it in a University 100 class, which was basically every week the kids came in and they got two hours on, like, where's the library? And you know, how do you put a banana on a, con a condom on a banana and all that other stuff? And we just inserted a half hour of this approach every week. And we actually reduced problem drinking significantly in the group that got the behavioral activation component. Right now, we're doing this in a residential treatment center in New Jersey for youth called Daytop. And they actually do it every day. And their counselors are the one who provide the program. And the very last slide is just a little um, attention to a study that Laura McPherson in our lab is doing. And she's actually using this approach to now study what we did with adults, but with adolescents. But one of the big problems with our treatment development studies is we don't know why things work. We think it's because we're increasing uh, reward sensitivity or, or the, the more positive things in their environment or how they experience them, but we really don't know. You can use self-report measures and try to do moderation, but it's not the, quite the same thing as really understanding things at a process level. So she's doing a study where she's actually using, with uh, Luis Pessoa, using um, imaging to really try to track what's happening to the youth as they go through this program, not only to stop quitting smoking, but doing this kind of reinforcement-based program. So I think I'm running out of time. So I just wanted to thank everyone from our lab. Um, and I still have Will Ackland here, even though he's right there and, and long gone, but we miss him. And then um, Brown, where I went to internship, and then uh, Yale, where I completed my sabbatical. So thank you very much, and uh, it was really an honor to be here. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, a great line. What we had done originally was we had just asked them w about where do you think the balloon popped, and they were way off. It wasn't predictive of anything. I think then we were way too focused on just predicting things instead of understanding, so we didn't follow it up in this way. But I definitely, I mean, even just at the level of the riskiest kid, is he risky because he's reward-seeking or because he's punishment-insensitive? We don't 
have any idea. There was actually a great article in Outside Magazine, which I don't know if anyone reads this, but it was about a year and a half ago. And the person who wrote it was studying adventure skiers and other people. And Russ Paldrick actually had like the crazy guy from the group do the BART. And to try to, I mean, obviously it's one person, but it was interesting for that one person. Uh, it was purely about punishment sensitivity and not, and not at all about the, the risk piece, which you would have expected it would be. I'm not trying to say that that answers that question, but it was really interesting in the way that she highlighted it. And to just even be thinking about how do we break it down in these processes, aside from just basic understanding, this would really be useful if we did want to use this for intervention because if someone's being risky because of punishment insensitivity and we're spending a lot of time on the reward seeking piece, it, it's not really making any sense. We have, you know, when I said before, and I, I grossly sped through this, but when you look at the task, when you just have them type in a number of pumps and then it does it on its own, clearly that takes all the, that piece out of it versus when they, you know, can manually make all the pumps. We, we don't see a lot of difference in those. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't different things happening, but we expected to see a, a pretty big difference in terms of those two manipulations and we haven't, but without doing it the way that you're suggesting and asking those questions and assessing it, we really don't know. So I, th I think it's an important thing to do. Carl, any, uh, uh, you're doing some translation work into the neuroimaging as a, uh, a way to understand the potential mechanism. Is there any translation into animal models to look at where you could manipulate it in more detail? The yeah, David Yench has a, an, a rap art and has been, uh, it's, it's published a few papers at this point. Um, they, uh, it's actually, I believe, with tones, basically two levers, one lever is the, you pump it up lever, the other lever is the collect lever, and then they get different amounts of food at that moment. And um, I, I can't talk too intelligently about the neural part of what he's doing, but I think one thing that is interesting is that one of the biggest factors he's found is it's the variability. Not necessarily who's riskier or less, which of the rat who, <laughs> which rat is more or less risky. It's the, you know, the rat who makes 19 pumps one time and two another time looks very different than the rat who makes eight or nine every time, even though their average number is the same. So it's allowed him to kind of look at the structure of what's happening a little differently. But there's definitely work there happening with that. Did you have yeah. yeah, at a, and this, this is one place where I think things have worked out the way we would expect. At a very young age, girls are riskier. And then as they get older, uh, boys are riskier. And we actually have some um, puberty findings where, now the problem is we didn't start collecting puberty data until I think the third year of the project. So it's a time where about half have reached it and half haven't. We can't speak to early versus late puberty, but we can speak to did it happen or not? And we get a huge difference. The, the kids who have hit puberty are much riskier. Now again, we can't speak to the is it early or not, but what we can do is if we follow them, well, as we continue to follow them, if it's truly about early puberty, then the kids who haven't reached puberty when they, uh, you know, as they reach puberty, I'm sorry, they shouldn't get riskier. They should, we should still have that difference. But if it's not about early puberty, but just puberty, yes, no, as those kids reach puberty, they should rise up and meet the other. So it's kind of a backdoor way to answer it, but I think ultimately we'd be able to look at that impact of puberty. But, I mean, I kind of jumped from the gender, but in the gender, we, we do see that very reliably. It's one of the few things I'd put a gun to my head and say, I think we're going to get it. And so.
Yeah, so that leads to two different things. One, which is slightly off, and then I'll come back to that, is what we wanted to do was have the peers be paid to try to encourage them to be less risky. So they would be paid the fewer balloons that they popped. So we haven't done that yet, but so that would be one question. And then the second one, we wanted to look at older adolescents and, and kind of pre-adolescents, and then have the parents be the one who are giving the feedback with the hypothesis that the parents can get the younger kids to be less risky, and basically the older kids will just say screw you and, and be twice as risky. So that would be, yeah, so that I think we can do some really interesting manipulations with that.